It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's first speaker. Dr. Stephen J. Kopp has been president of Marshall University since the year 2005, and it is a privilege to have him with us tonight to personally congratulate the students who are being recognized. Dr. Kopp. Thank you, Mary, and good evening and welcome, everyone. I've been asked to comment on the honors, what honors education means here at Marshall University. Marshall University is dedicated to the intellectual, social, emotional, and spiritual development and enlightenment of each of our students. Honors education elevates this commitment by setting the bar at a much higher level for students seeking greater challenges and opportunities. Among the groups of individuals vital to the success of Marshall University's honors program are our wonderful, generous benefactors who support the university's scholars, Marshall's Honors College, led by its founding dean, Dr. Mary Todd, our talented and dedicated honors faculty who assist and guide our students in deciphering their way through the intellectual labyrinths of learning that advance scholarly accomplishment. And of course, our outstanding student scholars, whose energy, dedication, and accomplishments make it all worthwhile. And the Marshall Drinko, the Marshall Drinko Academy. Again, I'd like to thank you for your attendance here this evening. And most importantly, I'd like to thank Dr. Libby Drinko for her generosity in making this evening's convocation possible. Thank you. Thank you, President Cobb. Our speaker tonight once shared the experience of many of you who are in the balcony, that of a Marshall student. A native of Barbersville, he came to Marshall after spending two years on a mission assignment for his church in Japan where his immersion in Japanese earned him credit for two full years of language upon his return to campus. His major here was vocal performance, but along the way he became Marshall's first webmaster, a job he held for two years until he graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1997. And then his career took a curious turn. For only three years later, he was awarded a PhD in Instructional Psychology and Technology from Brigham Young University. He tells me that he was not an honors student at Marshall, though he did take one honors course, and he said, without any prompting from me, that it was definitely the best course he had here. Since leaving Marshall, he has lived the advice once given by Ralph Waldo Emerson, do not go where the path may lead, Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Now Associate Professor of Instructional Psychology and Technology at Brigham Young University, Dr. David Wiley last year was named one of the 100 most creative people in business. He is a founder and board member of the Open High School in Utah, a charter school, and Chief, o Chief Openness Officer, I love that title, of Flat World Knowledge. Also the founder of opencontent.org, he claims simply that his career is dedicated to increasing access to edu educational opportunity around the world. He wants you to know that he has five children. I want you to know that if you go to davidwiley.org, you will learn not only of his fondness for Orson Scott Card and Ursula Le Guin and Tolkien, but the amazing extent of his influence on the future of higher education. Please join me in saying welcome back to a son of Marshall, Dr. David Wiley. Um, it's such an honor to be invited back. Um, I don't really know what to say except that I know you didn't come to hear me speak tonight. You came to see your sons and daughters and friends walk across the stage, so I won't be too terribly long. But I, I would like to say a few words uh, about this, uh, this topic, a permanent state of transition. 
I couldn't be on the uh, stage tonight without reminiscing at least a little bit about time I spent on the stage when I was a student here. Uh, this is a photograph from a production of How to Succeed in Business without really trying that was performed on this stage and that's me down there in the middle when I was younger and had more hair. Um, but I have such great memories of, uh, of this great facility and, and the productions we did here, this production, uh, Trouble in Tahiti, the Mikado, uh, a number of things. So thank you for the invitation to, to come back. Um, in 1997, I was a student here in the fine arts program, in the music program, and also working as the university webmaster, as Mary mentioned. And one day I was working on developing a calculator that was going to go onto a web page. And as I was building this calculator, which is something very simple, I noticed something uh, unusual about it. This calculator was very, very different from the calculators that we had used and I remembered at uh, Davis Creek Elementary School down in Barbersville on Route 10, where I'd gone to elementary. And that these calculators, we had to wait until it was our turn for that calculator to come round in the rotation. Whereas this calculator on this web page was usable by an arbitrarily large number of people simultaneously. Uh, much like the CNN.com homepage can be read by a large number of people at the same time. And I realized that this, uh, when things are made digital, something very magic happens. And I didn't know what that magic was, but I knew there was something special about things that were digital. I, I came later to learn that this magic is referred to by economists as uh, non rivalrous -ness. Uh, a resource is non-rivalrous when you don't have to compete for access to it and you don't have to wait for your turn to use it, when you can use it at the same time as other people um, are using it. Rivalrous resources, on the other hand, are things we have to compete for access to or wait in line for. Uh, knowledge is probably the best example of a non-rivalrous resource. You may know this quote by Jefferson. Uh, he who receives ideas from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So knowledge has this interesting characteristic that it can be given without being given away. And this is very important. If this were not true, uh, then all university faculty would be like the honeybee who can only sting once and then is done. Uh, you'd be able to teach what you knew one time, but then it would be gone and you would uh, be left without anything in your noggin. So this magical quality of being able to give without giving away is very important. Now, expressions of knowledge are very different matter. When I take that knowledge out of my head and I put it in a book, for example, then it's a rivalrous resource again. And if volume five is missing from the shelf, if Mary's taken it uh, back to her office to read, I can't read that book until she brings it back. So for a very, very long time, going all the way back to times we might have etched in rock or whatnot, those external expressions of knowledge have been rivalrous, while knowledge itself has been non-rivalrous. Now, this point about the CNN.com homepage and about any website that you read is that digital information an expression of that knowledge outside yourself is now also non-rivalrous. The same way that knowledge has been. And so now, in addition to knowledge having that characteristic that we can give knowledge without giving it away, we're now in a situation where we can give expressions, externalized expressions of knowledge without giving them away. And this has never before been true in uh, anywhere in human history. Now, almost all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all the intuitions that you have, the things that you just know down in your gut, are based on this common experience you've had that you have to compete for everything. Uh, this tug of war here representing that kind of competition. We know, we just know deep down in our guts that there are some things that you just have to compete for or you can't get. You can't have them unless you take them away from someone else. We call this kind of thinking scarcity thinking. Uh, thinking that uh, if you have the book, I can't have it. Or if I've taken the newspaper, 
you can't have it. And not only is much of our thinking and our feeling based on this principle of scarcity, but much of our economy is built on it as well. If we take the news and the entertainment industries, for example, um, I think there's some instructive lessons for us here. Uh, for example, CDs, uh, you mentioned I was a Tolkien fan, so I had to get, there's another Tolkien reference coming later. But CDs and DVDs and books and newspapers are all physical objects. If you've got the DVD at your apartment with it in the player, I can't watch it now. So these are resources that we have to compete for access to. However, of course, lots of people want to watch movies, lots of people want to listen to music, lots of people want to read the news. And so businesses jump into that space and say, we can create these things and we can distribute them to people so that people are able to watch the books and listen to the, watch the movies and listen to the music and read the books that they want to. However, this little device, which uh, came into existence this last Saturday, is sort of turning things on their head. This is the iPad, if you haven't seen this yet. And as many of you know, uh, instead of CDs and DVDs and books and newspapers, much of the interaction we have with media and news media now is in the form of MP3s, uh, MP4s in the case of movies, electronic books that we download to Kindles or to our iPads now, and also newspapers that we read online. The MP3s, the MP4s, the electronic books, the web-based newspapers are all non-rivalrous, meaning we can all listen to music on a Pandora stream at the same time, or we can all watch a digital movie streaming from Netflix at the same time, or read the Herald Dispatch online at the same time. And so this position that's been held, or this role that's been played by businesses historically, who've played that role of copying and distributing these physical objects to us, that middleman kind of role is no longer needed. And uh, we're seeing all kinds of reports about the death of the newspaper and, and these kinds of things now. Um, this, is a, this fundamental change in the rivalrous versus non-rivalrous uh, nature of expressions of knowledge is turning things around. Now you may, maybe some of you in the balcony aren't old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock. I hope that many of you will. One of my favorite Schoolhouse Rocks was the one about the Bill who sings How He Becomes a Law. Um, as this as the nature of expressions of knowledge has changed from being rivalrous to being non-rivalrous, what we've seen in many businesses is instead of trying to leverage that change somehow to a business advantage, they've instead said, you know what, we know how to run our business when information is scarce. So let's use policy and let's use law to try to create an artificial scarcity, to try to make things seem like they're still scarce even though they aren't, because we know how to operate our businesses successfully that way. One more example of this in uh, education. The way we educate one another is also based on a very uh, scarcity kind of thinking. If we take the lecture format as an example, uh, going back at least a thousand years before Christ, uh, here we have Moses with the Ten Commandments and in the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy we can read that he tells the people you have to get together, you have to come regularly and we will read the law to you so that you can understand it. Now, getting together at a regularly scheduled time for somebody to stand up front and read to you is what we call a lecture. Uh, this is a 3,000-year-old format. Um, but there's a limit to how many people you can get within the sound of your voice. Of course, he's not working with the microphone. And books and scrolls and codices of this kind are very expensive. And so that's not an option for moving information around. So attending a lecture really is your only choice if you want to be educated this period of time. If we move forward uh, 2,500 years or so to early universities, um, as paper becomes more affordable, you see the students here sitting. Of course, it's still a lecture. There's still a person like me, kind of dressed like me, standing in front of you like me and uh, reading. Now, because paper has become affordable now, the lecture changes its name to the dictation. And the faculty member stands at the front of the room and reads very slowly from his copy of the book so that you can handwrite your own copy of the book. So you students up there who are ever complaining about what you had to do in class, at least you never had to handwrite your own copy of a textbook. Now you would think that with handwriting copies of textbooks being the primary mode of instruction in the early university that when Gutenberg and his movable metallic type uh, come along, 
metallic movable type come along, that the nature of the university had changed very uh, dramatically. Because before, we've been spending all of our time standing at the front reading to you slowly so you can handwrite your own books. Well, now printed books are affordable and anyone can buy them. So what do we do at university now? Well, you can see on, well, you can almost see on this page how early books, the type ran all the way to the edge of the page. The innovation we get from the university from the printing press is something called the lecture format of a book, which has a wide margin. And now the professor stands at the front of the room and he reads his annotations to the book to you and you copy the annotations down by hand in the side of the book. Uh, and this is a picture from my own university, Brigham Young, where the seating is a little nicer, but uh, 3,000 years later, we're still working in this same format. Now, I want you to imagine, I expect many of you have had this uh, experience in the library. I want you to imagine going into the library and saying, hey, I'm here to pick up the newest, whatever it is, I'm here to pick up the newest uh, Harry Potter book. And the librarian says to you, I I'm sorry, but fiction is only open from seven till eight. If you want something from the fiction section, I'm gonna have to ask you to come back at seven o'clock. That's uh, absolutely absurd, you would say. And rightly so, because that book is just sitting there on the shelf waiting for you. Um, I tried to explain to my children once that there was a time when if you wanted to watch a television program, you had to be in front of the TV at a certain time, and you had to have the TV on a certain channel, and they couldn't believe that that was true. And I expect many of you up there might not remember this time either, but things like TiVo or Hulu have taken television programming and uh, to use, to borrow a term, bookified them. That they've made them available to us at any point uh, that we want to access them. When they used to be available to us only in a broadcast format, in a certain place, on a certain channel, at a certain time. So an important question for us in education then is why is the lecture any different? Why has the lecture not been bookified? And the answer is that the lecture isn't any different. The lecture is now a non-rivalrous resource as well. As soon as it's recorded uh, in audio, recorded in video, it's a broad, the lecture is a broadcast medium, just like television or radio, and a lecture can be made available on demand. I read a study just two weeks ago about a professor who'd done some work with a class where he'd invited some people to come to class like normal and he'd recorded those lectures and had other students in other sections of the class just watch the video and had forbade them from coming to attend lecture and had met with them only uh, much less frequently to answer any questions they had while they watched the videos. The, uh, the people who wrote the article wrote that the results of this study were mixed. Mixed because the people who watched the video instead of coming to class did better in their learning, but they came less frequently when it was time for them to come. And because they didn't come as often, they felt like that was a bad thing, and so the results were mixed. It wasn't only about student learning, it was about how many people come to hear me talk <laughs> when I give my lecture. Well, the lecture has become non-rivalrous. Let me give you a few examples. I don't know, by show of hands, how many of you have heard of MIT's Open Courseware initiative up in the top there? Can you hear me in the top there? No one's raising their hand. I see two hands, okay. Down in the bottom right-hand corner here, you see a professor uh, who's giving a lecture on linear algebra. He's purportedly the best linear algebra teacher in the entire United States. His name's Gilbert Strang. And MIT sets up a camera in the back of his class and videotapes it, and they not only make it available to students at MIT's campus, but they make it available to anyone in the general public, anywhere, at any time, completely free of charge this class and another 1,900 other classes. Every class in the catalog at MIT is available online in some kind of way. They don't all have video. The ones that don't have video have the lecture notes that the professor reads from. But they've taken and they've bookified this experience. Carnegie Mellon has another initiative that's very similar. The University of Berkeley at California has another initiative that's very similar as does Brigham Young. Stanford University delivers all of their videos and their content through iTunes, so you can download them to your iPhone and listen to somebody talk about game theory or the philosophy of death or something while you're on the bus. University of Oxford delivers 
its content through iTunes, as does Duke, as does the Open University in the UK. And all of this content is provided to you at no charge and with permission for you to take it and share it with your friends or translate it into Spanish or do whatever you want to do with it. Now, they don't award credit and there's no one there to answer your question, but they do make these things available. In fact, uh, this Open Courseware Consortium here has over 200 members and the members are all universities who have initiatives like this. You can see the geographic list here, Afghanistan, Australia, Austria, Brazil, Canada, Chile, it goes on and on. There's a similar group of uh, community colleges that work together in the same way and promote this idea of uh, sharing their materials. I'd point out to you a very interesting site called Academic Earth. I don't know if any of you know this site or not, but Academic Earth collects all the videos shared through iTunes, through web pages in different ways from all these universities and pulls them into one spot so you can watch them easily. So at the bottom here, there's Gil teaching uh, linear algebra at MIT again, and here's an introduction to Dante at Yale or game theory down on the right. These are all freely available. There's even a textbook publisher that has gotten uh, interested in this way of distributing information. The whole point is that these institutions have seen this fundamental change between rivalrous, the way that expressions of knowledge were once rivalrous resources and now they're non-rivalrous resources, and they're taking baby steps. Now, obviously, just putting some videos on the internet isn't a complete education. Just putting some lecture notes on the internet isn't a complete education. But this is kind of the obvious first response, the first kind of thing you might do once you see what technology has enabled and once you understand that now these expressions of knowledge can be given without being given away. Now, just a few more words. Professors are generally a happy lot, in my experience, partly because they do things like this. And it shouldn't surprise us that uh, educators are willing to share in this way because education is an exercise in sharing. If you don't know something, and I do know something, and you'd like me to share that with you and help you reach the point where you do know it or know how to do it or know how to feel about it, that, that's called sharing. And in fact, we call the educators the most successful educators who share the most completely with their students. If every student in that classroom comes out knowing everything that the faculty member tried to share with them and having received what was offered, then that's a successful educator. Now, <laughs> yeah, not my little girl. I'm sure I could have found one, but a picture of her. Regardless of this new foundation that has been laid in terms of this change in the fundamental nature of expressions of knowledge, uh, some of our faculty colleagues will never overcome their inner two-year-old and want to share. And that's a sad thing because the less they share, the less opportunities their students have to learn. When I withhold or when I conceal or when I do something that's the opposite of sharing, uh, I'm just getting in the way of your learning. There's no two ways about it. We even hear cases of uh, educators taking a page from the recording industry's playbook and actually suing their students. There's an interesting case in Florida a few years ago <clears throat> where a faculty member said, my lectures that I deliver are my copyrighted material. The notes that you take are unauthorized derivative works of my copyrighted material. And as such, I will control what you do with them. You're not allowed to share them with other students. You're not allowed to post them on the internet. They're already copyright violations. I'm going to control what you do with them. That's not a very sharing kind of attitude. So I want to propose to you this evening that uh, in many ways, the primary measure of whether a person living in what we rightly call a knowledge economy the primary measure of whether that person really understands the world around them or not is whether or not they've overcome scarcity thinking. We might call the opposite of scarcity thinking abundance thinking. This idea that there is plenty out there. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go to Google and search for something, my problem isn't finding too few things. You know, I find tens of thousands of things. There's not a shortage of information. There's not a shortage of these expressions of knowledge. There's an abundance of them. There's an overabundance of them. 
And uh, this flips all of our old assumptions upside down. Now, I promised you one more uh, Tolkien reference. Galadriel said, the world has changed. And technically speaking, she was uh, right. She is right in what's happening in our world as well, technically. But a at a higher level, she's wrong because the world isn't changed. Of course, the world is changing. It's always changing. Every day, it's different. Things continue to change. And in fact, the rate of change, there will be a test later about which derivative is the rate of change, uh, honor students. The rate of change is just astonishing. It, it not only changes, but it changes faster. And then it changes even faster and even faster. A handful of examples. Students, when you in the balcony entered high school, none of these majors on the board uh, existed. There is no career path you could have charted through high school and through university to prepare yourself for a, uh, for a major in nanotechnology because just as recently as when you were starting high school, these majors did not exist. By show of hands, how many of you have watched a YouTube video in the last week? Like every hand up there should be raised at this point. Many hands down here. When you were seniors in high school, YouTube did not exist. Five years ago, YouTube was founded. And now uh, over 200,000 videos a day are uploaded to YouTube. And it would take something on the order of 100 million years back to back to back to back watching video to watch all the video that's on YouTube right now. How about Facebook? Who, uh, who, who checked your Facebook in, sometime this week up there? Come on. Yeah, people down here too, right? Your freshman year of university is when, you, is when uh, Facebook opened to the public. Four years ago, Facebook now has 400 million users, 200 million of which check the website every single day. If Facebook was a country, it would be the third biggest in the world ahead of the United States, second only to, or third only to China and to India. And the U.S. Department of Labor estimates that you sitting up here by age 38 will have had between 10 and 14 different jobs. Contrast this to your grandparents who probably went to work one place, worked there all their life and retired from that position. So things change very quickly. Things come out of nowhere. YouTube comes out of nowhere. Facebook comes out of nowhere. And has 400 million users in a four-year period. Well, just even though it's a still picture, it makes me nervous looking at her here. You might rightly argue that the emergence of the uh, web, the internet generally, but the web in particular, in the early 90s marked a major transition for humanity, because it did. It made knowledge and expressions of knowledge both non-rivalrous. We might also rightly argue that your graduation from Marshall University marks a major transition in your life. But in both these cases, this discrete event, this one publishing of a document by Tim Berners-Lee, which was the beginning of the World Wide Web, or this moment at which you move a tassel from one side of your cap to another, that discrete event is just one domino. One domino that falls over. Now, the first domino in this chain might uh, have some prestige by the nature of its being first. But if it falls and fails to create this great cascade that we expect from it, then its fall will be utterly uh, uninteresting. This actually isn't the statue of John Marshall that's here. This is one from DC. But you can't. I guess the message I, I want to communicate to you in the balcony is that you can't stand still. You can't be like this statue of uh, our namesake here. Learning is the quintessential change. It's the kind of change we all have to be engaged in. And to be successful in this life, and being from Brigham Young University, I get to say, and beyond this life, you have to stay in a permanent state of transition. You have to always be growing, always be improving, and always be learning. That's what life is all about. And I find it difficult to believe that your graduation from Marshall University at this particular point in time is some kind of accident or happenstance. Looking back, I can see that mine was not. 
you've put together quite a bit of hard work combined with talents that God gave you, combined with assistance from the faculty and the administration at Marshall. And now you, each of you finds yourself in possession of a collection that's very unique, a collection of skills and of knowledge, of attitudes and values and experiences. At the same time, these technological advances I've been talking about have really literally rewritten one of the fundamental ground rules of human experience that expressions of knowledge are now non-rivalrous. So tonight you stand at the intersection, at the nexus or the vergence of these two events, this preparation of yours and this collection of opportunities that have never before existed in the world. So the question becomes not what have you done, but what will you do next? Whatever you do choose to do. I hope that uh, God will bless you in all the adventures you have to come. Thank you and congratulations on your graduation. I'm going to pose a question to David because it, it's one question that's been on our minds as we think about the role of faculty in the future. And uh, I think David has illuminated some of the very interesting opportunities and also some of the very interesting challenges. And the question I'm going to pose to David, and I, he doesn't necessarily have to answer it, is when you begin to look at all the resources that are available today, and David's done a superb job of highlighting them, you begin to understand that there's a transition happening from the role of professing to a role that faculty can play uniquely as designers and architects of powerful learning experiences. And so one of the questions we're pondering is if we are transitioning from the role of professing, what academic title should we use to replace the term professor, because in a sense, we're reinforcing something that's 3,000 years old and is not the gateway to the future. So I leave that question with you. On very auspicious occasions like this evening, the Drinko Academy confers special recognition to a very accomplished individual in the form of the John Deaver Drinko Distinguished Service Award. This award recognizes individuals who have exhibited by their contributions to society the qualities most valued by the Drinko Academy, engaged citizenship, volunteerism, project leadership that enhance broadly education, civic responsibility, and social well-being. This evening, we are very honored to bestow upon Dr. David Wiley this uh, award on behalf of the Drinko Academy and Marshall University. David, congratulations. Please come around. David, we also have a plaque to commemorate this evening and uh, the presentation of this award. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Moore, Chair of the Honors Council. While the focus of tonight's ceremony is of course on students, we want to take this opportunity to thank those who have been their teachers. 
In your program, you will find a list of the stellar faculty who have taught various courses in the Honors College in this academic year. Will faculty who are pre present please stand so we can thank you. Let's thank them even though they aren't here. We would also like to express our thanks to the deans of the other colleges, for we depend on them to share their faculty with the Honors Colleges and its students. Will the deans present please stand so that we can thank you. We regret that Provost Armiston was unable to be with us this evening as Chief Academic Officer of the University. He would ordinarily play an important role in this event, and he does play an important role in the establishment and continued support of the new Honors College. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Nikki Locasio, Interim Director of the Yeager Scholars Program. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> I'd like to give my personal congratulations to all of our wonderful honors students. Um, and I would like to ask the audience if at this time you could join me in a round of applause to acknowledge those of you, the honors students listed in the program. Thank you. At this time now, we will recognize students who have been identified by their faculty for outstanding achievement, and I'd like to ask them to come up on the stage, please, one at a time. If you could hold your applause till the end when we're finished, it will be a little more efficient. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Because you have a lot to, I have a lot to talk about. Um, re recipient of the A. Mervyn Tyson Award. Additionally, outstanding student in humanities, outstanding student in philosophy, John Marshall Scholar, and of course, university honors, Justin L. Pennell. You go across. Thank you. I know. Okay. Outstanding freshman in the honors seminar, Shana Taylor. Outstanding student in the honors seminar for sophomore, Audrey Dean. I'll do my best, Peter. Okay. Outstanding student in honors seminar, for senior, John Marshall Scholar and University Honors, Peter Marshall Zazowski. John Diva Drinko, the St. Mary's Scholar, Jessica Marie McClure. Lewis College of Business students, the outstanding student in accountancy and legal environment Grant Matthew Grishaba. Do my best. Outstanding graduating senior in finance, Kevin Wynn. Outstanding graduate, graduating senior in economics, John Marshall Scholar and University Honors, Alicia. K. Hess. That's what I thought. Outstanding student in management, John Marshall Scholar, University Honors, Lacey J. Bittinger. Outstanding student in management information systems, Keith Adam Bradley. From the College of Education and Human Services. Thanks. Oh, of course. 
take me a while. Outstanding graduating senior in education, additionally outstanding student in mathematics, John Marshall Scholar, University Honors, Maggie Chenoweth. Outstanding student in family and consumer sciences, Hedrick Scholar, University Honors, Amber D. Kelly. Mark Gatchka. Gatchka. I should know this by now. Outstanding student in recreation and park resources, Mark A. Gatka. College of Information Technology and Engineering. Outstanding student in engineering, Mark Andrew Upton. Outstanding student in safety technology, Andrew Ramey. School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Thank you. Outstanding student in advertising, Molly Elizabeth Grove. Additionally, university honors. I'll do my best. Outstanding student in broadcast journalism, Mariah Danielle Hissom. Outstanding student in public relations, Kaylin Renee Adkins. Outstanding student in radio, television production and management, Stacy Nicole Renner. From the College of Liberal Arts. Thanks. Outstanding student in Latin, Constant M. Ballard. Thank you. Outstanding student in communication studies, Rachel Nicole Huff. Jaeger Scholar. Outstanding student in criminal justice, Caitlin Miller. Outstanding student in English, Casey Evans. Outstanding undergraduate in history, Kristen Tibbs. Outstanding student in political science, Ariana Price. Outstanding student in psychology, Vanessa Rogers. Outstanding student in religious studies, Virginia Grake. I hope I can do it. Outstanding student in anthropology, Ennis Barbary. Thank you. Outstanding student in sociology, John Marshall Scholar. University Honours, Susan Kaplinger. College of Health Professionals. Thank you. Spirit of Nursing Award, Caitlin Barto. College of Science. Thank you. Outstanding Student in Communication Disorders, Bethany Cox Phillips. Thank you. Outstanding graduate in chemistry, John Marshall Scholar, Rebecca Ragland. Outstanding student in geology, Nathan Rohrbach. Outstanding student in integrated science and technology, James A. Staley. On. Of course. You know I can never do it. 
sorry. Honours College, John Marshall Scholar, University Honours, Halima El Kwazi. Sorry. <laughs> she got me nervous. Thanks. Irma Bird Scholar, John Marshall Scholar, Aaron Matthew Brownfield. Jaeger Scholar, University Honours, Elizabeth Diane Truex. John Marshall Scholar, University Honours, Brittany Lynn Davies. John Marshall Scholar, University Honours, Corey Andrew Keaton. John Marshall Scholar, University Honours, Sarah Page Sexton. University Honours, Katrina Harper. University Honours, Sarah Elizabeth Scaff. Congratulations to all. That concludes this evening's program. Again, thank you to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. David Wiley, to our president, Dr. Stephen Kopp, and to all who have helped make this event happen. Please enjoy the refreshments that await you in the lobby. Have a good evening. <laughs>